This is Laura London, and you're listening to Speaking of Jung. My guest today is Jungian analyst, author, and lecturer, Jan Bauer. Born and raised in the United States, she attended the prestigious Sarah Lawrence College in New York, then went on to study in Paris, where she graduated from the Sorbonne in 1967. After returning to the U.S., she earned a master's degree in adult education from Boston University, then taught at the high school level in France and Tunisia. She then moved to Switzerland, where she lived for nine years and underwent analytic training at the C.G. Jung Institute in Zurich, earning a diploma in analytical psychology in 1981. After relocating to Canada, she began practicing as a Jungian analyst in Montreal, where she continues to do so to this day. Ms. Bauer was a lecturer at the University of Montreal and served as chairperson of admissions and director of training for the Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts. She is also past president of the Association of Jungian Analysts of Quebec. She lectures widely throughout North America and has written two books, Alcoholism in Women, The Background and the Psychology, published by Inner City Books in 1982, and Impossible Love, or Why the Heart Must Go Wrong, The Hidden Meaning of Love's Disasters, published by Spring Publications in 1993. She has also written a number of papers, including Money's Mysteries, An Exploration of the Meaning and the Psychology of Money, and Be Dazzled, Charisma, Its Light and Its Shadow, both of which are the subject of our talk today. This interview is being recorded on Thursday, May 10th, 2018, through the magic of Skype. Hi, Jan. Hi there, Laura. I'm really interested in your time in Zurich. You lived there for nine years, and were you doing your training for the entire time? No, I was not doing my, my training for the entire time. I was doing my training from... 75 to 81. In the 70s, a lot of Americans were arriving in Zurich. It was really the peak of the interest in Jung. And like many Americans, I arrived there too. And I went to the Institute and I announced to them that I was going to become an analyst. And I would, where did I sign up? <laughs> and so the lady at the Institute, who turned out to be, um, kind of the gatekeeper, uh, looked at me with sort of astonishment and blasé and said, no, you're not. You need to go into analysis first. <laughs> go away and come back next year. So I went away to an apartment in Zurich, and I got into analysis for a year and a half, and I started to explore Zurich and make some contacts. And then eventually I went back to the Institute, and I was admitted now, these were the years where it was, I have to say, so much easier. Um, you went because your soul and your psyche took you there. And Zurich was very open to that. You couldn't do that today. You have to go through admissions processes and uh, much more rigorous screening and vetting. And uh, they won't even open the door to you unless you've already done all the paperwork and all the requirements um, to be admitted. No one could just do what I did at the time, but lots of people did it. Yeah. Why, why do you think that changed? What happened? Well, I think it just changed with the times. Right. In the 80s and the 90s, everything has become more standardized, uh, both in psychology and in other areas. There's a, a kind of, that's true of schools too, a, a move towards standardization and tests and certifications and, you know, uh, things like that. <laughs> so you were an educator and your master's degree is what allowed you to enter the training program. I know that in addition, you needed to be analyzed yourself and, right. but right. you did have that graduate degree and what prompted you to want to become an analyst? You were a teacher. You know, that's a good question. I loved teaching. It was, it's a real vocation for me. I loved teaching. I was a teacher in Tunisia when I was there with my French husband. We were both teaching in local high schools and I just loved teaching. I, then I 
took this degree in adult ed, which at the time was new at Boston University. It was very exciting. And um, as I got into the field more and more, I realized that I wanted to go deeper. I loved teaching, but I wanted to go deeper. Something in me wanted more to go into individual work and deeper than just transmitting education. I really wanted to do something more intense and deeper. Mm -hmm. And I had a certain crisis in my life at that time that led me to start reading. My first book, I think, was Boundaries of the Soul by June Singer, which was a real classic. It's about her time in Zurich. She was an analyst. I think she died recently, but she was an analyst. And she talks about her time in Zurich in analysis, and it completely enthralled me that this person took this quest to learn about her inner life and her soul and the psyche and something at once very personal and bigger than herself. That led me to consider going to Zurich. Uh, So as I said, I finally packed up everything in Boston and I left and I arrived. And I thought that Zurich would be waiting for me and it clearly wasn't, but that was fine. Uh, That forced me to take the time to do the analysis and get used to life in Zurich. And since I had lived already many years in France and in Tunisia and in Italy as well, I felt um, part of me was very accustomed and liked living in Europe. I think it's still part of me, and it's why I'm in Montreal and not in New York. It's like half of me is more European and half is more American. So I was very taken by the fact of living back in 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 Zurich after my years in Boston and was quite ready to stay on and on and on. And once I got into the Institute and went through it, uh, even afterwards, I thought I would stay on. But I realized when I finished my diploma and began to have a practice in Zurich that that was no longer a good idea. I had had very intense experiences in Zurich. I loved the fact that (laughs) it was, as one of the analysts said, Zurich is so introverted and so, in a way, unfriendly (laughs) that everybody is forced to go into themselves. Mm -hmm. And has been said very often, you can do a slow-motion psychosis in your training in Zurich. Uh, There's Zurich. What what, what do you mean by that? A slow-motion psychosis. You know, it's funny. That was often said by many of the analysts. And it's a very important thing. Because we were separated, we were not in nine to five work lives. Uh, We were out of our own environment. And Zurich, as I said, is not especially friendly um, and not especially buzzing with activities that were available to us because Swiss German is a very difficult language to understand. So we were isolated, but that created a possibility of intense inner work. And um, Zurich gave the gift that I don't know any other place could give of great tolerance for psychic dysfunction. Learning to trust the psyche, that is what we get, we received as a gift. Our analyst would say, you're depressed, go into it. Go home and write about it, draw about it, listen to sad music. Don't try to get out of your depression. So there was a huge both tolerance and Um, what can I say, trust in psychic movement um, that we were able to take as a gift from Zurich. And I'm very grateful for that because coming back to North America, I very quickly realized that there was, that did not exist. Uh, That life is much faster. There's a much more sensate attitude to problem solving rather than exploring. And It's been, for people who come to see a union analyst and learn that they can explore their depression and listen to it instead of trying to solve it, I think that's still a very important part of what we do and what we offer people. But I only learned that in Zurich. Have you been back recently? Is it, would you say that for the people that are considering training there, that it's still like that to this day? Absolutely. I would say it's still like that. That they still, I'm my, I have many friends there that I made over those years. Right. And um, whenever I go, I'm always 
pleased and happy to be there and surprised because I realized that they still, people still take the time to see each other, to have dinner parties, to get together. Uh, they simply are not in the kind of frenetic rhythm that we are in all the, all the time. And that, that is true of analysis too. People, many people still go twice a week to analysis, which has become a very unusual luxury in North America. Right. I mean, we have to accept that people come once a week. Sometimes they come twice a month because of both money and time constraints. Yeah. It's just possible to do the, the, the twice a week tradition. Yeah. And I'd like to talk about that a little bit more when we get to your uh, paper on money. Okay. But for now, uh, in, in just finishing up your sort of how you got to where you are now. And you had mentioned to me uh, when we spoke earlier, you had referred to Zurich as a city of fathers. Right. And I had not heard of it described that way before. What did you mean by that? Well, I mean, it's historically, it's a Protestant city. It's a city that was very, very influenced by, during the Protestant Reformation, by a man called Zwingli, who was the Zurich equivalent of Calvin, who was in Geneva. And these Protestant reformers, Calvin and Zwingli, were extremely patriarchal, very um, uh, severe, I would say. Um, the, mm -hmm. the big cathedral in Zurich is not a joyous, Baroque, um, decorated cathedral like many Catholic cathedrals, where no matter the fact that it's still very patriarchal and run by men, the actual Catholic world is far more full of what I would say anima or feminine um, aesthetic. There is a search for beauty um, and there is a certain feminine element. While the, the Zurich uh, architecture is very severe as if that would be a wrong distraction. And I remember Jung talking about that, saying at one point, he had to choose between the seduction, because he's a very good illustrator and drawer mm -hmm. and had a great talent, and he was torn himself between the seduction of what he called his anima, um, Salome, leading him on to make these wonderful drawings and the more important project of exploring alchemy and exploring the unconscious in a more severe and, I would say, logos way. So Zurich itself remains a very masculine place. It's a place of business. It's not a place of arts. And even though music is the one place where the art comes through the most. Mm -hmm. But it's a place of business. And that's why Jung actually moved there from Basel. Because Basel is a much more, um, I would say, cultured and academic city. While Zurich has always been known as the sort of brash Zurich brash Swiss city and you moved there because he was interested in being in a place where the reality principle was very present. So anyway, all that to say that when you graduate from the Institute, uh, it's very, because they, it's full, it's a small place. Your colleagues are there. Your analysts are there. If you want to teach, if you want to be active in, the Jungian world, you cannot escape your mentors and your analysts, many of whom were, mass, were men, mm -hmm. the most of whom were men. And the, um, the organization of the Institute was very masculine. And it, it became clear to me that in order to set out on my own, I needed to get away. And I set away from the fathers because the fathers are very present. They're, they're present in the history, in in the fact that it was young, he's a man, in the fact that most of the analysts were men, and they were wonderful. They gave me priceless gifts. But in order to do my thing, I needed to get away. One of the things I wanted to do, for example, was teach, because I'm a, I just love teaching, as I said. And if I stayed in Zurich, I would have had to wait years to go up the hierarchy in order to become finally what they called a didactic analyst. But that would have taken at least five years mm -hmm. where I would have to, you know, jump through the hoops and do my practice. 
And then the Institute would decide, well, I received an invitation to come live in Quebec and in Montreal by a colleague, Guy Corneau, who was a contemporary of mine in Zurich. And he wrote me at the time and said, come to Montreal and see if you like it. We need analysts here. So I came one summer, gave some lectures, fell in love with it, realized that it really answered many of my prayers. In other words, I could come back to North America, which I, I wanted to do in many ways, and I could continue working in the languages I loved, which were both English and French. So Montreal and Quebec really answered my prayers, and that's why I came. And the other side was that in those years, now that's no longer true here, but in those years, it was a free-for-all. If you wanted to teach and people asked you to teach, you could teach. I could set up my own seminars. People came. There was a very active young group that set up constant seminars. So from the day I got off the plane, I was very active in training and in teaching, which would never have happened in Zurich. And I was 40 when I finished my diploma. So I really, it was a second career. I didn't feel like waiting for years to have the right to start working, you know, in these, in this area. A couple things. One is, you mentioned that most of the analysts in Zurich were men. Uh -huh. Would you say that that's true in Canada, in the U.S. as well? No. No, I would say that the movement has gone the other way. Mm -hmm. uh, that, And in fact, that's true in, in, um, in Zurich too. Uh, I think somebody was telling me that the whole world of analysis has become, I think, majority women now. But that's true of all the helping professions. Mm -hmm. That's true of all the helping professions, including medicine. Uh, more women graduate from medical uh, faculties, mm -hmm. more women in the helping professions. That's true everywhere. So that has changed a great deal coming to Montreal for you, you described it as a reconciliation of opposites. What do right. you mean by that? <laughs> that's a term um, that's very Jungian. We talk about the tension of opposites, mm -hmm. and it's profoundly Jungian. He, he talked about that a great deal as being one of human beings' great challenges was the tension of opposites uh, that we all very often live in our lives. For, ex um, for example, do I stay in Montreal, where I'm happy, but maybe in Minneapolis, I'd be more famous. Shall I go to Minneapolis? Uh, in my patients, I often see the tension of opposites in much more ordinary ways. And for example, do I stay with my partner or do I go with my lover? Uh, do we um, stay in this house or do we go to another house? And people are constantly caught in between two choices. And for some, it can be harder for others. And the lesson that Jung taught us, which is so deep, is he said, hold the tension. He said, don't choose. It's so tempting to go, like, let's say a man comes in and he's very torn between his wife and his lover. And it's so tempting for him to say, okay, I throw out my lover because it's too much for me, or I divorce my wife because I can't stand the tension anymore. And what we'll say is try to hold the tension. Try to just see what each means for you. Hold it, hold it, hold it. And slowly the psyche is working on that. And some answer will emerge. And we call that the third. Now, a third isn't necessarily concrete. It doesn't mean another woman is going to show up. But a third means a change in attitude. After holding it a long time, a change in attitude. Oh, well. I, I begin to see that really family life is more important to me than anything else. So that's the choice I make and the sacrifice. Or I begin to see that family life is too stagnating. I have to make the other choice. And this is something I see both men and women having to make very often in our culture, these different decisions. But the important thing is to not try to jump too soon and make a decision just because it's hard not to. Coming back to why, for me, Montreal is a way to put my opposites together is because it's both old world and new. It has a lot of European touches. 
and a lot of very North American sides. Mm -hmm. I can work in both French and English, which I greatly value and greatly enjoy. My life is always in both languages, and that's a real treat for me. So it allows me to bring these different sides of myself into being, which I don't know any other place would, frankly. You had said that there's not as much anima in Zurich, and I had just seen that Montreal was originally called the City of Mary. You're right. It's Ville Marie. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Ville Marie. It's totally true, and it has. There's a lot of anima in Montreal. Very much so. It's really a city that was founded uh, by religious orders to a great extent, in honor of Marie. <laughs> yes. Now that doesn't mean it doesn't have the usual patriarchal history and unbalance, so to speak. But still, yes, very, very different from uh, Zurich. So would you say that we are drawn to places that hold or carry what's missing in us, our opposite, or we're drawn to places that kind of are a reflection of us? So you didn't want to stay in Zurich where it's more masculine and you know, it's a it's a place of business that doesn't seem to be the way you are so is it that you wanted to be in a place where you felt more comfortable and at home and you didn't there well um i think we have to be very realistic here <laughs> uh, it was very practical for one thing i needed to make a living i'm just wondering about the places that we are attracted to, since we're talking about how you feel in places. And right. I could relate when you were talking about Zurich, it was making me think about how, oh gosh, about 20 years ago or more, I started visit visiting New Mexico and I was very different when I would go there. I was, ah. I was going there three, four, five times a year. Right. For a week at a time. And I just was so much more extroverted, even huh. though it was an introverted place because it's so sparsely populated. But I would go to meetings and groups and I would walk into bookstores and have conversations with people <laughs> and, and go to dinner and see people that, you know, I knew or knew of and we'd all talk. And, and I'm not, I wasn't usually like that at the time. You know, I was, I'm a city girl. I was born in New York City and mm -hmm. I live in Chicago now. And it was a place of solitude, but where, I mean, I think the unconscious would come alive. The dreams yeah. were always deep and vivid and long. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, because I'm very curious about this, because I've had so many people throughout the course of my life just pick up and move to, either a different country or a completely mm. different part of the United States. And mm. I was always very curious about that. How can you leave mm. everything that was familiar to you mm. or your you know, family of origin and just set up someplace mm. completely new? And it had always made me wonder what it was that, that they were drawn to. So you could say it's practical things like money, um, yeah. but I'm, um, Wondering what else is going on there. No, I, okay, I hear you. And I think it's very important, but I do think, can I discount the fact that people often have to move for a job? Sure. And, and, and America is very mobile, much more than any other country. Uh, I mean, we're extremely mobile. We don't think that it's strange to pick up everything and move to a different city. Right, but uh, then to live and thrive there and love it and want to stay there. Right forever is one thing but to have to relocate for a job and then just right. hate it but right. stay because you, you want to keep the job is, is something yeah you know I mean ideally if we go into another level here ideally I think there are what I would call fertile places in our lives okay mm -hmm. at different times Zurich was a fertile place for me for many years France was very fertile, extremely, for many years. Mm -hmm. And then they weren't anymore. It was time to go to another place. And Montreal has been extremely fertile for me. Um, it's allowed me to 
expand, to work in all the ways that I love to work, to have a practice, to teach. I cannot say how grateful I am to have been able to come here and how fertile it's been for my particular way of existing. So, yes, I mean, and coming here instead of going back to the States, which of course was the other option, I could have gone to France too, actually. I'm also a French citizen. I could have gone back to France, but going back to France would be just a slightly more feminine version of staying in Zurich because they have the same hierarchy mentality. So I, I would have had to do the same stuff, waiting years before I could teach and stuff like that. And I really wanted to come back to North America because there was so much more freedom about what you can do as, as a young analyst. And that's why people come to North America, because they're leaving a certain hierarchy that's so strong in, in Europe. So coming here was certainly a, a great deal, a search for freedom to completely let go and be all that I could as an analyst and be solicited to work in private practice, to teach, to write. It was quite wonderful. It was, I mean, it's, I feel very blessed that I had the opportunity to be um, solicited to give all that I had to give. And that's, that's really a great blessing. I'm very grateful for that. And I don't think I would have had that in any other place. One of the things that kept me from going back to the States is that, especially after my time in Europe, is that I've always had a slight feeling personally that my country, the United States, has lacked a sense of the tragic. And I'm very, very sensitive to the tragic. It's very important for me. It's part of shadow. It's part of the condition, the human condition. Um, there's a great deal of tragedy in the Montreal history, and it's present. Well, it's very, it's always hidden in the States. We keep trying to put it under the table. And I find that takes away from psychic depth. So that, too, is part of my attraction to being here, where the sense of the tragic is very present for many reasons, historically, but also, I would say, even because of the climate. That's interesting. It's, so would you say that that is why these these fields, such as psychology, are so... I don't know, I, I came across that this week, that somebody higher up, I don't want to name names, didn't want to be involved with anything that had to do with psychology or astrology. And when people that, that I know who are not involved in psychology, when I say something psychological, they'll make a joke out of it that, Oh, that's so, you know, you're, you're going too deep or that's right. That's right. too right. touchy feely for me. And I'm mm -hmm. thinking, come mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. really? So is, is that what you mean here in the U.S., that we don't want to go there, as they say? Um, it's a bit, yes, it is that, on one level. I mean, you can certainly find people here. It's not as if the sure. Canadian population is all turning towards young and is all sensitive to psychology. Right, right, right. Of course not. But there's not the compulsion to keep it light. Now, I have to say about that, that that compulsion to keep it light has also been a source of dynamism for the states and has led to innovation and great advances and making the United States be such an important country is that very optimism um, and the refusal to linger on tragic things. Personally, just my individual personal tendency and need is to be able to linger in the tragic. <laughs> I just resonate with it. I resonate more with a certain European attitude. I think I know what you mean. My, mo my mother was born in Europe, and all four of my grandparents were born in Europe as well. And they came here to the United States, to New York City, where I was born. Um, but when I'm in Europe, I feel much more at home mm -hmm. than I do here in the U.S. Actually. There you go. Yeah, uh, and so I visit um, quite frequently 
Uh-huh. But you can certainly explain that a lot better than I can. I think that when I met with criticisms, which are a, a projection of mine, I believe, about how it's doom and gloom, doom mm-hmm. so negative, <laughs> what do you say to that when people come at you with that? Well, I don't have people do that anymore. Right. <laughs> because I'm not in the States anymore. I'm not with my family anymore. <laughs> but certainly when I was with my family, I got that a lot. I still do when I get in touch with them occasionally. That's exactly what happened. Now, the people I am friends with in the States now do not tell me that because I've made a circle of friends right. from Zurich and from other places that tend to have the same sens- sensibility that I do. Mm-hmm. But I don't think there's much to say. I think... It, there's nothing to do but protect it. Uh, I don't think you can expect people who are not interested in that to change. And I think if you're in a world where a lot of people are saying what's the doom and gloom stuff, I think you just need to be quiet and protect yourself and play play a game a bit. I just I, I put on a persona, and I'm interested in everything they do. They never ask me questions about my life, and I'm thinking, oh, isn't it wonderful that you have horses and airplanes and vote Republican and have succeeded in everything materially and Mm -hmm. admire things for a week and then I collapse and have to come home. (laughs) See, now for me, when I come across that, I usually think seeds will be planted. Uh That I don't look at people like that saying they will always be like that. I look at that and saying eventually something's going to wake them up to themselves. Okay. Something's going to wake them up to the other parts of themselves. They're going to experience some difficulty or some tragedy, um, and eventually they're going to start to go a little bit deeper. Is that maybe not the case? Is it the case that you just need to leave them alone? Well, I think the fact that you say that, Laura, mm-hmm. is why it's good that you're there and I'm not. <laughs> Um, and the United States needs people like you, and I have very lots and lots of very good friends who are analysts who have similar attitudes that see that in a much more open and tolerant way than than I tend to. Um, but at the same time, I think I think it's good not to be naive. People change when they are absolutely obliged to. Yes. When they are hitting a wall, they do not change just because it would be better or you know all sorts of other reasons, they change because they have to. And even then, when they have to, very often people resist and do what Jung, that wonderful expression of Jung called regressive restoration of the persona, Mm -hmm. where let's go back to the way it was before. Um, You know, instead of trying to learn and transform from crises. So it's, yeah, sometimes people change, sometimes they don't. Let's switch gears here a little bit um, so that we can cover some of the material that I originally wanted to talk to you about, and right. one of them is money. You had sent me your paper that you have been presenting on called mm-hmm. Money's Mysteries. In the beginning when you were talking about moving to Zurich and living in Zurich and being in analysis for a year before you entered the Institute, right. I was thinking about money. And yeah. people listening to this today in 2018 mm-hmm. are thinking, well, I don't have the money to do that. Right. Well, at the time, um, you could teach. And I taught in a um, language school. I taught English mm-hmm. in the evening almost every night for years and years. And believe it or not, you could earn a decent living. You could really earn a decent living. Salaries are high in Zurich. I liked teaching, so it wasn't, and it was a, you know, a change from the intense studies of analysis. So it was possible. I had some savings from over the years to both teach and use those savings and make it. But I don't think you could do that today. Mm -hmm. I don't think you could earn the same kind of money. And the prices have gone up so so much that it, it is truly very difficult. Yeah. It's true. So your paper on money talked about money as a connector. Yeah. I would like to, you know, when I'm studying this subject, now I have to say a lot of the, the reason I don't consider the paper I should 
publish or anything, because a great thing is a great part of its derivative that I added to. But I began to realize, studying the subject, how much young money allows us to connect to people and situations we would not otherwise connect to. And that sounds sort of theoretical or ordinary, but in fact, it's very profound and very crucial to social well-being in the sense of money allows me to go to my local convenience store and buy milk or whatever I want to buy and talk to the people from Sri Lanka who are there and see how they're doing and get a little glimpse of a very different life. Um, and it's money that allows that. I'm, I'm not about to go to their store and just say I'm here. Money allows me to have a cleaning lady come in once a week who I consider actually more of a house manager than a cleaning lady because she takes care of everything. Mm -hmm. And we're very, very fond of each other. We have great respect and great affection for each other. She's a top professional and we both respect each other, but we couldn't do that without money. Um, my clients, I mean, that's evident. You know, when people complain about the prices or I guess in a slight parody of the Freudians, they say, oh, it has to be expensive. It has to hurt to be worth it. I think that's an old trope. I don't know if they still say that, but I don't think that's the point. I do think that people need to pay something because the money there, really important in therapy, money both connects and protects. Very important. What do you mean by protect? Okay, I'm going to explain that. It connects, obviously, because a person comes in to see me, and we both understand that I'm going to be paid for the service, and the person will have to bring a certain amount of money. Now, every analyst has to decide what's reasonable and what standard of living they want to have. That's also part of money and how we have to personally come to terms with it. I have analyst friends who are much richer and others who are much less well off, but everybody decides personally how, what standard of living you want and how you can provide it. And so that's part of it. But once the person is there and they agree on a certain fee, that fee not only will connect us for a certain number of weeks, months, or years and allow for this process to take place, but it protects us. And it protects us in this, in this way, in that, that money says that this time belongs to the patient. It's their money. It's not mine. So my attention belongs to them. They have paid for it. They have a right to have their hour. And you know, when people come in and apologize for talking about something or talking too much, I point out to them that it's their time. And it's important that they understand that it's their time to use, to use in a way that they want to use. But it's theirs. It's not mine. They're not trying, here to please me. So it protects in the sense that it also says, I don't have a right to start talking about my problems. And saying, well, you think you have problems, listen to mine. Right. I'm going to tell you all about my divorce. Their money protects them from me talking about that. It says, you're the professional, you listen to me. You're here for me. Now, of course, I'm going to exchange if it's appropriate and I find it helps the therapy. But only if it's in service of the psyche and the therapy, not for my own needs. As long as we're talking about this subject... Something that's come up um, frequently over the past year is this attitude about how Jungian analysis is only for the privileged few. Now, I, of course, got defensive when I heard that. I had a very long analysis. I'm a proponent of Jungian analysis. That's what this podcast is all about. Right. So my initial reaction was to get defensive about it. And then I came back and thought, okay, what's going on with me? 
You know, I'm a little bit torn about that statement. When I say I got defensive about it, I tried to explain how that wasn't the case. Maybe it is the case to a certain extent. Anyway, this isn't about me. <laughs> what do you think? No, no, I, I understand. Um, and this is not new, uh, Laura. Sure. This has been said since the beginning of Jungian analysis. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, you know. Um, so it's it's very, it, and it comes up more at certain times. Mm-hmm. Now, I think we could say financially it is absolutely not true uh, that psychologists charge just as much, if not more, at least here in Quebec. I don't know. I know in the States there are all sorts of prices that astonish me um, by both psychologists and analysts. Here we're, we tend to be very sort of in the middle. Um, I charge, I have to pay sales tax, 15% sales tax on each hour, so I charge like 130 and I keep 110. <laughs> um, that's okay. I mean, that's normal. Some people charge more or less. Okay. Um, so I don't think it's financial anymore. I think that psychologists charge just as much. Other approaches charge just as much, I think. Um, well, I, although, say, I think the difference is that here in the U.S. anyway, I know that yeah. the, the medical insurance situation is quite different in Canada, but here in the United States, Jungian analysis is not paid for by insurance for the most uh, part. I don't know. It wasn't when I was in analysis. Okay. So it's been about... It, well, it's been several years since I've been in analysis, so I don't know if anything's changed. Um, if you go to, I think, a psychologist, a right. clinical psychologist, that right. might be covered. I'm sure that they, they have a limit on it. Right. So if you just go and pay your $5 copay or your $10 copay, I'm sure that's more attractive to most people than right. paying out of pocket for Jungian analysis. To um, me, they're completely different. Right. Types of therapy, in double quotes. So I think uh, I, yeah. one of it is, is people think, okay, well, if you're in Jungian analysis, you have to pay all of it out of pocket. Yeah. Well, you see, yeah, I, I hear you. And that is, in fact, particular to the States because here everybody pays out of pocket. Whether they see a psychologist or no matter who they see, they pay out of pocket. At the most... They have insurance, which will pay five times. And I have several clients who have insurance, and that will pay five times. Me as well as a psychologist. So your socialized your- medicine there in Canada doesn't cover this? No. Okay. I didn't know Absolutely that. not. Okay. The psychologists are lobbying to get that. Oh, okay. They're lobbying very hard to get that. And I think there would be some good in that. Because it's always true that many people who really need therapy are not able to get it, and the public resources are not enough. Right. That That is, I totally agree. But, okay, if we go back to the elite side, we could say that in, yes, it is elite. Like any individual service that you pay a certain amount for, is elite. It's elite to have a cleaning link. Right. We can agree with that. Okay. Um, it's it's elite to go regularly to acupuncture. Um, these are all paid out of pocket. Right. So yes, uh, it is not available to everybody. Furthermore, I don't think that union analysis is for everybody. Yeah, good point. I mean, why would it be? It's like, is classical musical for everybody? No. Um, should it be free for everybody? Well, maybe more, but <laughs> it's certainly not for everybody. Is rock for everybody? No. There's no human activity which is good for everybody. And I often compare it to having a musical ear, that some people really have a musical ear. That's quite incredible. I don't, but some people do. And it makes them be able to be musicians, to appreciate music much more than I could. And to go to all sorts of different musical activities that I would not go to. Uh, I think analysis is similar. I think that you have to have an ear for the psyche. 
and that not everybody has that. An ear for the psyche and also a searching, a questing part. And that's not true. I mean, lots of people are perfectly happy just getting by or just earning money or just raising families or just, 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 whatever. And they don't consider that a just. They consider that their life. Um, and going to analysis, looking inside, is a minority activity. Yeah. It simply isn't everybody's thing. And why should it be? So in that sense, it's elite, like classical music is elite. Like going to a museum is elite. Yeah, okay. Another thing you bring up in your paper on money is the concept of relationship versus money. Right. Why is it that? Why is it relationship versus money? Well, because relationship is a feminine archetype. Okay? It's the mother or the feminine. It's a feminine archetype with all sorts of different um, aspects, whether it's parental or partnership or friendship. Sorry, that's someone coming from my dog. Well, money is a masculine. It's, it's the power archetype. Okay. It's not a feminine. It's a power archetype. You can manipulate, use, misuse, whatever. It's a power archetype. So already you have two opposites here. And because we have a long Judeo-Christian tradition of considering money to be the root of all evil, there's always that somewhere as well. Um, it's still in the psyche of most collectivities to some extent. Mm -hmm. Now, Wall Street, all these, the, since the 80s, has sort of, you know, disproved or gone against that. Money has become the standard for almost everything. But this is quite new. This is quite recent, the fact that the money archetype and the business making money archetype, the commercial archetype, I should say, has taken over as the main Western archetype. There's a really great book by someone, do you know Jane Jacobs? I don't, no. Okay. She wrote The Life and Death of American Cities. She's a wonderful commentator on life in the collectivity. She wrote, I'll, I'll email it to you. She wrote something called Survival Systems, where she talks about human history until very recently being um, a society, being divided into what she calls the commercial side and the guardianship side. And the guardianship side is institutions like government and hospitals and education. And then the commercial side, of course, is business. And each society needs both. But they're different archetypes. And like professionals, doctors, lawyers, notaries, helping professions, we belong to the guardianship side. And in, in that we belong to that, we are protected. We do training. We're protected. That means that my neighbor can't set up a shingle and say he's a union analyst. So I'm protected in my profession. Mm -hmm. However, in exchange for that protection, which the system gives me, I'm not supposed to get really rich. I'm supposed to make a decent living. Okay. But I'm not supposed to make money a priority. While the commercial person, the business person, takes a risk, all sorts of risks, and competition, and his neighbor can try to do, so it's a, it's a much looser world where there's very little protection. So riches is a valid, a valid reward. So the, historically, these two archetypes were very separate. You were either on the guardianship, you worked in government, you earned a decent salary, you were a doctor or a nurse or a therapist, you earned a decent salary, but you don't get rich. But that's okay because you have a protection. Your neighbors can't do the same thing. And then if you strike it rich on Wall Street, then you're that's a different archetype. Good for you. 
but now they've collapsed and they've con gotten contaminated and the archetype of the professions and the government and the guardianship have been highly contaminated by the commercial archetype, which is why you have advertisements all over the walls of schools. Um, you have doctors marketing themselves, any all helping all psychologists having to take marketing courses. This is new. This is only since the 80s. Before, it wasn't allowed. Uh, doctors were not allowed to advertise, nor were um, analysts. Um, it was considered both Ill unethical and practically illegal. Um, but now it's all over the place. And this language of marketing, and you have to know how to get yourself out there and market yourself, this is completely new. And it's actually a, a serious contamination of archetypal paradigms. So all that to say that money and relationship um, are, in fact, separate archetypes and need to be brought together in a very conscious and nuanced way. When we are training as analysts, this is not true of psychologists in the States today, we're not taught about money because it's a completely different archetype. So we're not at ease with it. Um, who grows up knowing about money? Not very many people. I mean, it's really been, when I say money's mysteries in that lecture, it's been and it remains, it's interesting, it remains a, a source of mystification in the society that there are priests on Wall Street who know about money, and most of us don't. Mm -hmm. And it's considered rude in most areas, but not all, to talk about money. Uh, yeah. So any, there are all sorts of taboos around it and, and ignorance. And why is that? Well, I think the taboos and ignorance are because of the Judeo-Christian mm -hmm. tradition that it somehow wasn't done to talk about and learn about money. Um, that was certain men's concerns, and they will do it among themselves. And they, it's, they have kept it among themselves. They're, it's one of the few groups that have really kept their own mystique, very much so. And others... We tend to, especially in the helping presence, we tend to uh, either condemn or have contempt for it because we're ignorant. And you had also mentioned the fear of envy. Yeah, very much so. Very much so. We, we hold back and we don't want to discuss it because... That's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that afraid is... Are afraid that it's going to damage the relationship? Uh, yes, I think that is very true. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very true. That money, it's a connector, but it's a separator too. Uh, that, yeah, it's a source of tension between people. Because if you have friends who are in exactly the same strata, both socially and financially, there's no problem. You talk about the barbecue you bought, the trip you took, mm -hmm. the decorations you're doing, everything's fine. And there's no tension. But if you talk about that with friends who are not in the same social strata and financial ease, mm -hmm. then it's very uncomfortable. So it's always causing slight problems. I see, I see that in my colleagues. I mean, some colleagues are really very, very well off and do things that most of us can't. And there is no doubt that there is envy and a little resentment that somehow we've all done the same training. How is it that you're doing that and I can't? I have to say I've always been inspired by when I see somebody doing something or having something that I don't but want yeah. or think that I can't and I see other people do, then I'm inspired by that. And I don't like to hide who I am or what I do from people. And, um, but I, I do run into that a lot, especially with traveling. Uh, when people hear about how much I travel, they don't understand right. it. Okay. And yeah, and they are confused by it or make comments about it. And I, I don't want to hide it. I want that to inspire people that, that want to do the same. But I will say, I think that 
the thing that I hear people struggle with the most or complain about the most is money. I, I, I don't know if it's money or relationships. Um, now you mean around in your world or, or in general or what? In general, in my world and in what I come in contact with every day, what I see, what I hear um, right. is that that it's all about money, that people can't do things because of money. They can't do what they want to do because of money. That's interesting, Laura, because I don't have that. I don't come into contact with that at all. Now, I probably have a much smaller population I come in contact with, but I do think that part of what you're talking about is an American madness yeah. um, that has be, it come so concentrated on that. Yeah, I, I point out to people that and I think I was talking about this earlier, and I'm sorry uh, if I've repeated this on the podcast. For me, I talk about choices and that perhaps I've made different choices. Right. I chose not to have children, and I chose not to have a large home. I right. live in a small condo. Right. It's about what are my priorities, and I yeah. don't want to keep up with the Joneses and do what everybody else is doing because yeah. Because I do know people that care about what their neighbors think. And yeah. They have to keep up with the other families. Like I said, I've made different choices, which has mm -hmm. allowed me to have money to put toward other things. Right. I think that's very balanced of you and very, very lucid and very balanced. And that's the way it should be. Well, and it also analysis was a huge priority for me. So sure. I spent money on my analysis. Right. But I didn't buy a new car every few years like right. like people around me were doing or or a bunch right. of other things. I don't have a boat. Right. You know, and there are a lot of other things that I don't have because they just right. didn't have as much meaning for me uh -huh. as spending it on my analysis and on <laughs> traveling. I'm all about having experiences in life and not right. so much about owning things. Right. That's interesting. And you see, when you talk about that with people around you and the fact that you're traveling a lot and having these experiences, I can imagine that for some people that um, makes them feel inferior. Well, not at all. I mean, do should I feel inferior because I don't have a large four bedroom home and a car? No, 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 no. But you're not you're I think you're underestimating something. If I may say so, sure, um, please. you've made choices to have your condo and to travel instead and to get experiences, right? Yes. And that's all very conscious and that's terrific. And in fact, you let yourself be inspired by people who have something you don't, mm -hmm. which is the ideal way to deal with some envy. Oh, that person is, I don't know, traveling more than I am. How could that be? What can I do to make it happen? I mean, the ideal way of dealing with envy is to turn around and say, what can I do to also yeah. go there or acquire that or whatever? That's ideal. Mm -hmm. That is not that frequent. If you tell a lot of people around you who are not traveling and have not traveled that you're doing it all the time and you've been, isn't it interesting, you've been here and you've been to Montreal and you've been to Paris, blah, blah, blah. Whether you realize it or not, you are going to create in some people a sense of invalidation and inferiority. That's their complex, right? Well, it is their complex, but it's also your lack of tact. Let me give you an example, mm -hmm. okay? Um, when I first came back from Zurich, I was I struck it. I just struck it rich here in the sense of, I immediately had patient, patience. I immediately had things to do, teach. Mm -hmm. It was paradise. I was 40. I was starting a new profession. I was working in English and French. I was so lucky, and I loved it. I had a very good friend from Zurich. She had to stay in part of the Middle West because for her daughter, and it took a long, long time for her to have a decent practice. It was hard. It was hard years for her. Mm -hmm. And I learned in those years when we talked, because she was a very close friend, that I simply stopped talking about how much I was doing and talked about my inner life and dreams and love life and all sorts of other things we had in common. But I didn't talk about the groups I was doing, the practice I had, because I realized it was too much of a difference between us. Mm -hmm. 
and it created a feelings of envy and discomfort. And I just had to come to accept that I could only talk about those things with people who were equally happy with their lives. So is that you taking care of her feelings, you being conscientious, you being kind? What is that? No, I think that is a social awareness. Okay. That's what I think it is. That, that it was a kind of loss of innocence. Here you think you can talk about just anything with your really close friends. Mm -hmm. But in fact, I sort of had to learn, no, that's not true. You can talk about things that you have in common, but you can only really let go and talk about everything with people who are happy or content with their lives or accepting. I would say accepting because I have a friend who's very sick and I talk to her a lot and I talk to her about my successes and failures completely openly because she has is completely accepting of her life as it is mm -hmm. and is able to hear mine and be glad for me and talk about her funny things that happened to her. But there's a level of acceptance that she's come to. So I never feel that I'm dangling things that she can't do anymore. I mean, I know my friends right. and, and I know which ones I can talk about everything with and which ones I stay on certain subjects. And, you know, mm -hmm. I have another friend who is a, very successful professional who talks all the time about his successes and his travel. And I have to say that I come away from those conversations feeling somewhat um, dull mm. and a little bit defeated. <laughs> mm. Even though we have a very good relationship on many levels, when I hear about all these wonderful trips and wonderful experiences that for many reasons I can't do anymore, mm -hmm. I, I feel, I just feel a little bit inferior and unvalidated. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, not, a, he's much more interesting and has succeeded much more than I have. Is that because he's only talking about his successes? Probably. Or good times? Because I just... That's a good point, yeah. spent some time with uh, some people that... Never stop talking, never stop talking. And it was exhausting yeah. because I felt myself constantly having to listen and pay attention to what he was saying and mm -hmm. to a point feign interest because he was talking about his neighbors, all of his neighbors and their personal lives. And it was interesting in the beginning, but it, this was going on for days. <laughs> and so the town that they live in, uh -huh. You know, the, the damage, the fight where there were fires, where there, were, where there was new construction, what used to be there, what was torn down. And again, this wasn't a, a trip through town one day. This was day and night for several days in a row. And at the end, and even during, I was completely exhausted. But when somebody is constantly talking about their life right. and just about how great it is well that's yeah. to me not realistic because no no experience no life nothing is all great we're human and we're in the physical world and so there mm -hmm. there's a lot of other things that that comes along with that so that's where i want to keep it real i want to talk about my struggles and i actually feel more comfortable talking about what it is I struggle with, what is what is wrong with this picture, right. um, instead of what's what's right about it, because I don't think very many people want to hear about the great time I had. And I typically don't have a great time. There's always I, the word struggle keeps coming to me. There are always struggles right. that come up. And I think that that's what makes it interesting, not how yeah. fabulous it was. I have another friend that every single time he calls mm -hmm. me, and I ask him how he's doing great. Mm -hmm. There's no way this relationship has been going on for 15 years. There is no <laughs> way that he is great all the time, but that's all I ever get from him. And you know what? That's not very interesting to me. Yeah. No, I think that's a very good point. And I thank you for pointing that out because it's a very, very good point. And I think that's, you just sort of made me click on why I'm, I always feel a little depleted after these conversations. Yeah. <laughs> There's no shadow basically. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. And is it the case uh, that when somebody doesn't acknowledge the shadow that you kind of have to sort of carry it for them? Yeah, that is a good point. Yeah, that's a very, very, thank you. That's very helpful. That's true. (laughs) Sure. I have a lot of analysis. Um, So is there anything else you want to say about money? Because I would like to cover charisma. I when I was preparing for our talk, um, those were the two papers that I focused on. And right. mm-hmm. um, the other one was about charisma. And I do want to get to that. But is there any? Sure. Left no, no, that's, that's, let's go right into it. <laughs> okay. So mm-hmm. what is charisma? Charisma, um, by definition, is a gift from the gods. And it is the power to create transformation in others. In others. Okay. Yes. And I think that's the important word to remember because it's used in popular language to replace something like sexual magnetism or attractiveness or all of those things. We talk about actors with charisma and we want politicians with charisma. Well, in fact, we don't necessarily um, because real charisma is a very powerful force that seems to be a gift, like a musical gift, like a gift for therapy, like a gift for art, that some people have. And it is the gift of being able to inspire and transform other people. And it's quite rare. I mean, if you take on the public sphere, someone like Gandhi or Kennedy briefly, um, Hitler, obviously, in the bad way, I would say Oprah Winfrey has it, definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's relatively rare, uh, this this ability to really transform, although there are many forms of it. There's very strong charisma, but there's also what I call soft charisma, and that's the the meeting with people in your life, a professor who changes your life because they inspire you to look into a subject more. We all have had something like that, or most of us. Or a neighbor who inspires everybody to get going and work on recycling more. Uh, You know, there are are also people with charisma in a more local and ordinary way Mm -hmm. who create transformation. Now, your paper's subtitle was Charisma, It's Light and It's Shadow. Right. So it's not always necessarily... I would say a positive attribute because cult leaders, right. which you reference, right. have charisma and do transform people, but not for mm-hmm. the better. No, that's why it's such a, that's why I like to talk about it because it's so misunderstood and mm-hmm. it's so powerful. It can be used for great good or for great evil because people who have a lot of charisma are able to actually put others in a state of altered consciousness. What is the yeah. difference between charisma and narcissism? Uh, quite a bit. And narcissism is a pathology. Charisma is a kind of authority. Uh, a kind. Of, it's a kind of authority, a kind of gift of inspiration. It's not a pathology. With a cult leader, though. Narcissism can be very present. And it's often present in people who have charisma, but it is not the same thing. But if you take bad cult leaders like Jones and the Kool-Aid thing, Mm -hmm. or even Hitler, they had charisma. You know, people describe listening to Hitler and feeling themselves going into a state of altered consciousness and feeling that all their lives problems were solved and they were in ecstasy. That's really strong charisma, and they were willing to do anything. And, you know, it's not just losers in life who are attracted to charismatic leaders. Yes, you mentioned that. What, would you say a little bit more about that? I mean, take Jung. He was very charismatic, okay? Mm-hmm. And a charismatic leader has a mission, not to transform other people. Their mission is to, they have a quest, they have a mission in life. Jung's mission was to explore the unconscious. That was his mission. And it was his all-consuming mission. 
and it was so consuming that it inspired others. But that's not what he set out to do. In fact, he kept saying, thank God I'm not a union. He didn't even want an institute. He didn't want followers. Right. He, he realized there was a danger of people being manipulated and trying to be too much like him. But he was charismatic, and he did inspire, as we know, many. Well, that's why we're here today. Many, many people with his charisma, but he had a big shadow, Jung. He was not an easy man in his family. He was not even an easy analyst with his colleagues. There are many, many shadow parts of him that come out in um, Blair's book, where you're glad you didn't know him personally, frankly. <laughs> now, what would you say to people who dismiss an entire body of work or an entire life because they're pointing their finger at that person's shadow. Oh, I, I just find that so narrow-minded and self-serving and uneducated and primitive that that's all I can say. <laughs> Thank you. That's all that needs to be said. So Jung had charisma. Hitler had charisma. Right. Cult leaders have charisma. Yeah. What inspired you to look at charisma and where do we go with that? I'll tell you what inspired me personally is I had an aunt who had enormous charisma. Mm -hmm. And then I had a meeting with this person called Guy Corneau. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He wrote a book that he wrote books that had been translated into English. And for a while, he was quite well known among the unions in the States. He wrote a book called, uh, Absent Fathers, Lost Sons. Okay. And he wrote that in 1989, and it was a bestseller in here and in, in France. And he became a very, very well-known lecturer, writer. He stopped doing analysis. He became extremely well-known. He had his television show here. He had a television show in France, traveled all over, gave workshops all over the world. Is I mean, very, very well-known in the more European and French world. And people wrote him letters about how he transformed their lives. He really was charismatic. And he had to deal with the projections about that. People, women would send him airplane tickets and say, here's your ticket, come visit me. <laughs> um, but he, he was driven by a mission to understand the psyche and to write about it. He wrote, I think, maybe eight books that are all bestsellers in French. And I met him in Zurich, and he became very close, and he was one of the reasons I came to Montreal. He invited me to come here mm -hmm. and was a colleague. And I watched him as his charisma grew with his writing and his appearances. And I watched this charisma act on other people, and I was absolutely fascinated. And how does this work? Mm -hmm. So, And I had this aunt also who was very well known in – in a particular area in a non-governmental organization in the 30s and 40s. And she had tremendous influence wherever she went. She would give talks and people would write and say, you've changed my life. And she would read those letters to us and then say, those people are stupid. What are they talking about? And tear the letters up. And I knew even at a young age that there was something wrong with that, that she was unable to accept the projection, but that something in her truly did inspire people but she kept refusing it. And so she would be very um, short and very mean sometimes with people when they came up and talked about their admiration. And that's part of the shadow. Mm -hmm. um, sort of not taking responsibility for the fact that you have an effect. Or the other part of the shadow, of course, is manipulating because you have an effect. I mean, I've, I've seen several patients who have had charismatic professors who've been very abused by these professors, who've been taken on as assistants and helped publish things. They're not recognized in their name. They're kind of thrown away when the next interesting student comes along. Uh, we all kind of know professors like that, but they, they do have a good way of transforming the student's mind and sometimes helping them. Even though they tend to, they tend, they turn out to have a very shadow side, which is 
which is somewhat cruel and rejecting. I mean, when you have that power of manipulation, it takes a lot of consciousness to use it well. <laughs> Trump, I didn't want to admit this, but Trump has charisma. Yeah. For the people, for his so-called base, he has charisma. Yes, I was thinking about him when I was reading your paper. Yeah, he really does. They are completely, they feel he can transform them, their lives. They are intoxicated by him, which is why he can do anything and he knows it. But that's charisma. That's true charisma. Yes, I can walk down Fifth Avenue and shoot people and be okay. And his followers would say fine because they are in an altered state of consciousness with the promises he makes and the power he projects. So now that's his charisma and not his narcissism. I'm sorry to keep bringing up. It's both. But it's both. Okay. His charisma is nourished by his narcissism. His charisma is serving himself. It is not serving a higher purpose. While the charisma of Gandhi was in the service of a higher purpose. The independence of India. Or the, the, the charisma of my friend Guy Corneau or of Jung was in the service of the psyche. Mm -hmm. It was not in the service of themselves. So what do we do when we find ourselves getting caught up in somebody else's charisma? Well, uh, that's a, that's a good question. You know, I think very often it's positive and while you're in it, there's not, there's not much you can do. Now, if you get caught and you're beginning to doubt and beginning to be unhappy, then you need to talk about it. Because one of the salient features of a charismatic individual is having no doubt. And that's always an alarm signal. There are several salient features. One is having no doubt. What I say is, is absolute. There's no doubt. Another salient feature is few friends. Lots of charismatics have very few friends. They have followers. They don't have friends. They are convinced of their mission. That's the no doubt, but they're also convinced of their mission and they make promises. They promise, if you follow me, this will happen. Your life will get better. You can see that. You can see that in Trump. But now somebody but like Jung didn't say that, right? Um, yes and no. I mean, many of his writings do say that it is a moral imperative to explore the shadow. And that there is an implicit promise that individuation, that the quest toward totality is more satisfying than ignorance of oneself, <laughs> of the psyche. I see. So when we run across this, do we protect ourselves? Do we just keep it in check when we find ourselves caught up in someone like this? I don't know how much you can do, Laura, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can talk to your friends because usually one person's charismatic is another's nothing. Well, yeah, I was going to ask you that too, is when someone has charisma, is everyone going to react to them? No, not at all. Because the charisma, charismatic is always picking up on an unconscious ideal of the audience. I mean, there would be no charismatic if there didn't wasn't this unconscious ideal. They need an audience where there is an unconscious ideal waiting to come to to being. And it's always the unconscious ideal is always about a better life. It's always about, yeah, it's always about something better, something unusual, something special. And so, I mean, if you look at Hitler, I mean, the Prussian elite in Germany at the time for 10 years sat around and laughed and said, what a, what a joker this guy is. He'll never go anywhere. They were not at all affected by his charisma which made them underestimate how intoxicating he was for all those people. And it's, it, that happened with Trump. He can never win. He's such a buffoon. He's such a joker. Right. 
you also talked about the charismatic person having to hold the projection. Yeah. I mean, ideally, and that's what I watched Guy Corneau do better than anybody I have ever seen do. Now, he was an analyst, so he was able to draw upon a great deal of knowledge about the psyche, including his own. And although in the beginning, I think he was pretty carried away because he was a bestseller very quickly and was asked to speak all over the world about this subject of fathers and sons. And he went through a couple of years where all his friends were saying, well, see you later, Guy, you're just impossible. (laughs) But he came down from that and began to be very conscious that carrying these projections was both a responsibility and a burden. And so he began to create a community of friends that he would consciously cultivate and be in touch with whenever he came back to Montreal and make sure that he went out to dinner with his friends and spent some time with them just to make sure that he could reconnect with real relationships Mm -hmm. where there's no idealization, there's no projection, we're just, you know, we, we care for you, Guy, but we know you're light and shadow and you can be yourself with us. And he, he was very aware of that and took it seriously and would really make an effort to, um, because wherever he went, people would come up and say, you've changed my life or would idealize him. And that's heavy to carry. That's and it's very easy to identify with, with what Jung called the mana personality. It's the same thing. Yeah they, yeah, they they typically don't last very long, do they? When we put these people up on pedestals, right? And they become enormous, like right. Michael Jackson or Marilyn right. Monroe, right? Or Princess Diana, right? Nobody can hold that kind of projection. And That's right. They are not analysts, right? Like Cournot, right? So they typically meet with an early demise. Would you say? Well, it's not infrequent. It's not infrequent. It's too much. What they ha- what they bring to the world is, in the cases that you cited, it has lots of positive to it. Elvis Presley, you could say, too. He was a transformative figure. Um, and the, they bring something positive to the world, but then they're stuck with all the projections, the expectations. And unless the only protection is cultivating a strong group of friends around, friends and family that keep you in your human dimension. And are not caught up in the celebrity and everything that comes along with it. That's right. The gods are merciless. They really are merciless. When they give you this kind of gift and you can use it, it's it's so tempting to think it's you. (laughs) My analyst, Tony Fry in Zurich, was a very great analyst, he told me something quite wonderful that I, I, I want to pass on. He said, he said, well, this was when he was about 55, which at the time seemed elder. <laughs> he said, it took me about 20 years to understand that when a patient had a really negative transfer on, transference on me, it was in fact behind me. It was a projection. It wasn't really me. He said, but it took me much longer to realize that when a person had a positive transference, it was also behind me. (laughs) Yes, that's wonderful. Something we need to keep in mind. Thank you so much for sharing that with us today, Jan. And thank you so much for your time. It's been very agreeable. Thank you for this conversation. So thank you again for your time today, Jan. Please visit the website, speakingofjung, J-U-N-G dot com, for more information on everything that was discussed here today. There you will also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast, which are available to listen to or to download for free. The episodes are also available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you get your shows. I've created a new YouTube channel where I occasionally stream live video updates. If you're interested in watching, please subscribe to the channel. It's free. You can also follow me on Twitter and Facebook for daily updates about the podcast, material I collect while preparing for guests, and I also do a random Jung quote of the day. 
Links to all of my social media accounts can be found at speakingofjung.com. So with special thanks to Charlie Arthur, Diane Braden, and Daryl Sharp, this is Laura London, and you've been listening to Speaking of Jung.